Okay, great. We'll kick off. Um, so this session we're going to talk about uh, what we at Kinfolk are doing with a um, product called Flatcar Container Linux and how we're continuing the core OS legacy with that. Um, so you're going to have two of us up talking uh, for this session. So there's myself, I'm responsible for business development here at Kinfolk and Iago will come up in a little while and, um, and give you the demo. Um, so first of all, just if you don't know who Kinfolk is, um, you haven't been paying attention because we're the organizers of this conference. Um, but <laughs> so that, that's this first point. We do cloud native community leadership. We, we organize this conference, all systems go. Um, a lot of things to support the cloud native community. Um, background in terms of kind of the technology expertise of the company is in a lot of kind of low levels uh, Linux uh, technologies, we do a lot of uh, BPF stuff, uh, kernel, system D, things like that, um, but also um, up the stack to things like service mesh as well and a lot of security consulting as well. Um, and most of the work that we do as a company is uh, engineering consultancy with a lot of the big names in the industry, but we also work with end users on uh, Kubernetes deployments and, as we're going to talk about here, on uh, their container Linux needs. Um, one point just to emphasize kind of goes with our community support is everything we do is 100% open source and you'll see that as I talk more about what we're doing with Flatcar and how that kind of influences how we think about how we take these technologies forward. Um, so, as talked about continuing the uh, legacy of CoreOS, so maybe it's worth for, um, you know, because the, the world has moved on um, since CoreOS was first founded, but I think a lot of the initial principles that CoreOS was founded on are, are still, you know, very much, um, you know, pertinent to the discussion today around cloud native. And there are a couple of things uh, that, that they would talk about. And, and the first was in terms of a founding principle was this very kind of um, idealistic goal of trying to secure the internet. And you know, this, is, this is a problem that's not going away, right? Um, you know, the internet still needs securing. Um, and uh, another kind of um, thing that they talked about was uh, what they call Giphy. And, has everyone heard of Giphy? Okay, a few nods. Most, most people, I'll come on and talk about that. So if we first think about what does it take to secure the internet and some of the kind of core elements of, of this. So, you know, there's just a huge attack surface out there. So let's reduce that as much as we can, particularly where we're deploying technologies that um, allow us to do that. Um, how, let's make systems more resilient by making the files that don't need to be changed actually immutable, so you could lock it down and make sure that they can't be changed. Get automatic updates built in, so in the same way that your phone tells you that a new OS update is available um, and just installs it without you having to think about it, why not make that happen on the servers that are powering the internet as well? Um, deploying things in, applica uh, in application containers and securing the runtime was also a big part of um, of CoreOS's uh, uh, early days and in fact that's where we at Kinfolk got involved um, quite extensively because we were involved very in the development of the rocket container engine. It was the first project that we at Kinfolk actually um, worked on. So at the time when uh, CoreOS was founded there was really Docker was the only game in town for a container engine and Rocket opened it up and said no there, are, there should be multiple container e engines, container runtimes and that led to the OCI standard and um, Container D and Cryo and all of the great things and innovation that you see now, which has, I think, significantly helped to um, secure the, the way containers are deployed. And then the principle of least privilege, so um, deploying, uh, not, you know, not using uh, root users when, when you don't need that for an application container and things like that. Um, Giphy stands for Google's infrastructure for everyone else. And um, you know, this is a, a quote from Alex uh, Polvi, who's the uh, co-founder and CEO of CoreOS. So Giphy is a style of managing infrastructure where you can pull the plug on any server at any time and the apps keep running, right? So the way that Google operates, the way that other hyperscale companies like Google operate, being able to um, run 
large-scale infrastructure with robustness, scalability, security, and reliability. So what does that mean in terms of this technology stack that you as a user, who's obviously not running at Google scale, is going to deploy? So there's a few aspects to this. So the first is immutable infrastructure, where um, you don't worry about keeping each server alive as long as possible. Uh, you treat it as cattle, not pets, in the um, well-worn analogy now. Um, you, you containerize the applications, which are dynamically orchestrated. Um, you need to support some kind of distributed state around those applications, and you need an OS that's container-optimized. And th these are kind of the elements, and if you look at what CoreOS built, um, which was you know, a very, very um, powerful set of technology, um, you know, from the bottom up, they had the, the fundamental operating system, Container Linux, uh, which was derived from Gentoo and, and, and Chrome OS, with no provisioning, technology ignition. Then there was the Rocket Container Engine, which I mentioned. There was um, uh, the SED consensus base uh, key value store, so something that allows you to um, uh, share, uh, share values around the cluster. And then they needed cluster orchestration and quickly uh, pivoted from the original fleet technology that they had to Kubernetes and packaged in the tectonic um, distribution. So this was kind of the core OS answer to, uh, to Giphy. And it was you know, going quite, quite nicely, I think, um, for, for quite a while and was getting quite broadly adopted. So for a while, you know, core OS was the, um, the, the leader, the, so, the sole fish in the, in the pond at that, at that point. Um, and then along came Red Hat and uh, gobbled them up. And, uh, you know, and then along came IBM and, and gobbled them up. So, uh, you know, so there's, there's some history that's, that's happened here. And, and uh, you know, I was just talking with a, you know, someone from Red Hat out in the hallway. And, you know, there's a, a, a lot of good reasons for what Red Hat is doing and, and how they're taking forward this technology. Um, but that do mean that it's maybe on a slightly different path from where CoreOS was going back at that time. So. What does the stack look like today? Um, Tectonic eff effectively is end of, end of life and because OpenShift is the flagship um, cont container management platform um, and doing quite well with OpenShift 4.0. Um, etcd, very vibrant and project because it's absolutely the core of Kubernetes. For those who don't know kind of what's under the hood of Kubernetes, etcd really is the secret source that makes Kubernetes work. Um, and it's in CNCF and continues to be managed as a community project. Um, Rocket went into the CNCF as well, um, but effectively has been kind of overtaken by some of the o other uh, container runtimes like ContainerD. Um, and and CoreOS, uh, Container Linux, has continued as a, as a com community project, has been supported by um, Red Hat, but effectively that's being sunsetted now, and they're taking some of the um, technologies into, uh, into Fedora, a thing they call Fedora CoreOS or RHEL CoreOS. Um, but there's a, a a couple of challenges with that one is that um, you know it's uh, it's actually quite different from upstream container Linux, so it's actually more like Atomic in some ways. And the second is, if you want commercial support on it, then you only get that as part of a bundle with OpenShift, and you know that's not necessarily what everyone wants. So in terms of how um, Kinfolk is taking some of these technologies forward, uh, we have a distribution called Locomotive of Kubernetes, which is um, derived from something called Typhoon, which is an open source project that uh, is also um, was based on Tectonic. Uh, so there's kind of an ins inspiration hierarchy there, um, and I think there's a separate session uh, at the at this event around uh, locomotive. Um, in this session, we're going to talk more about CoreOS Container Linux, and we're taking that forward with a product we call uh, Flatcar Container Linux. And so let's let's get into what Flatcar actually is. Um, first of all, you know, w there's this term container Linux. I mean, and there's a question, you know, do, do we even need a Linux that's different for containers than regular Linux varieties? And there's, I think of it as kind of three key characteristics that make it something a container Linux. The first is it's just a minimal distribution. So you take out everything that you don't need because your applications themselves come in containers which are packaged with all of their dependencies. 
So that reduces your dependencies that you have to manage in the core, in the core um, uh, distribution, and it makes less software for you to manage if you're actually running these uh, systems. It's also a key part of this security strategy where you need to reduce the attack surface area and allows you to do much more uh, repeatable deployment as well. The second is this immutable file system, where I think the way CoreOS uh, did this was uh, you know, really kind of genius, and um, it, it enables you to operate uh, at scale because you know you can reason that every single host at a given OS level has exactly this set of files um, in, installed. And you can, see, you can see the benefit of this um, in, fr from a security perspective. There is, you know, as an example, the um, uh, Run-C vulnerability earlier this year. Uh, we put a blog out when that came out just showing how if you try and uh, uh, apply that exploit to a flat car um, container Linux machine, then it just doesn't, uh, doesn't do anything. And then the third is these automated uh, streamlined updates. Um, and again, this is about being able to manage at scale, being able to get all the security applied, and, and also being able to easily roll back is a key part of that. So after saying, well, what is a container Linux? Well, what is a flat car? Uh, and when I first heard the name, I, wasn't, I, I didn't know this, so it's, it might be worth explaining. Um, flat car is actually a term for the railway rolling stock that you put containers on if you're trying to transport containers by rail. So we all kn know the kind of, you know, the, the ship um, analogies for containers. Um, when you start to transition into rail, that's where a flat car comes from. So I think it's a really cool name. Um, what are we doing uh, in terms of distributing flat car? Uh, so CoreOS Container Linux had three channels, alpha, beta, stable, with kind of an increasing maturity for each of those channels. And we've added an additional one called Edge, um, partly because of our community approach to how we'd like to do things. We want hackers to be able to try things out, uh, submit, a, you know, submit a PR to put something into, into Flatcar um, just to see how it works. So it's kind of experimental. There's no guarantee that if something's an Edge, it's going to make it into the production alpha, beta, um, stable uh, kind of series. Uh, it gives us a way to try out the latest technologies, um, and that's, that's, that's proven to be really popular uh, it, because we've seen a lot of folks want newer things that aren't, haven't been done by um, the upstream CoreOS container Linux, uh, and that we frankly wouldn't be ready to put into production, um, but who want to try that. Uh, th these images are all publicly available. You can create a new node on packet and, and request um, a flat car on it. And we have an update server uh, that you can pull down updates from with for the kind of automated updates. Um, then there's also a thing called Kinfolk Update Service, which I'm, I'll, I'll come and talk about. So um, uh, one of the things that CoreOS had with Container Linux was a managed update service called Core Update. And this was one of those things that was behind the paywall. So if you were a paying CoreOS subscriber, you would get access to this update server and it would give you fine-grained control. So rather than every host getting updated as soon as it went and checked the server, you could do rate limiting. You could say, I only want so many servers per hour to be updated. I only want to do it during certain hours. Um, and you could do that by groups across your whole fleet. It also gave you monitoring and visibility across the fleet. So you could see how many nodes were on which version, give you an audit trail of updates and all of that kind of thing. Um, but because this was behind the paywall, it's closed source, um, has the um, you know, implication that basically as CoreOS Container Linux comes to end of life, this has end of support as well. Um, and there's no way for the community to pick this up. So at Kinfolk, we have launched this update service, um, which effectively uh, replicates all of those capabilities of core update. Um, so the fine-grained control, the monitoring visibility, but it's 100% open source. So we have a project called Nebraska, which is uh, behind our update service. And if you want to deploy on-prem, you, uh, you can use that. Um, and we've got a blog post just published about 10 days ago, I think, which, um, which explains all the internals of this and uh, gives you a lot more detail on how this works. So you know, we're looking for contributors to that if anyone wants to uh, participate. In terms of actually migrating, if you have container Linux deployed and you want to switch to uh, Flatcar, 
it's just like doing a version upgrade of CoreOS um, container Linux. So uh, a couple of things you have to do. One is update the public key um, that's, that's stored so that your node will know to trust this, the server that it's talking to. And then you change in the, in the um, config file, you change server setting to point to the, the flat car update server rather than the CoreOS update server. And it just picks up a new version. And of course, rollback is just like rolling back um, uh, an update. And there's a a link here to, uh, to update if for anyone who wants to do that. Um, so where we're at right now, we have all of our build infrastructure set up, all of the uh, CI, CD proce uh, CI process for, um, for Flatcar. We have, we've got a team, um, actually, I think Tilo uh, is here at the conference, um, tall German guy with a beard, um, and he was formerly the head of the uh, program manager for AWS EC2, Linux kernel, and hypervisor uh, development. So what he doesn't know about Linux probably isn't worth knowing. Um, we have the Edge channel maintained independently from upstream, so we build it independently. Alpha, beta, stable will um, very soon start to get their own uh, builds independent of the upstream build and start to get features that are not equivalent, you know, that go beyond what's in upstream core OS container Linux. And we have uh, all the support infrastructure in place as well. So we have some customers with 24-7 support, um, thousands of nodes, et cetera. Um, where are we taking this? Uh, which I think is, for me, kind of the most interesting thing and exciting thing, because we're now at this point where we're breaking away from upstream. We're starting to be able to add new features in. And uh, so you're going to see things, uh, I think, quite quickly accelerating with, because I think there's a, a, a good future ahead for, um, for container Linux. Uh, so the first thing is we want to get a new kernel in. We're, we're hearing this from a lot of users at the moment. Uh, CoreOS is on a 4.x kernel. We want to get that up to uh, 5.x kernel. Um, one of the things that comes with that is uh, more advanced BPF, Berkeley packet filter functionality. So we want to uh, exploit that with the user space tooling uh, to support it. Uh, there's some system, uh, an overdue system D update. Uh, Cgroups v2 is super important for a lot of reasons. Um, and uh, we've also also want to get a better debugging support. So we had one customer come to us and say, we're getting these intermittent crashes on this particular server type, and we can't get diagnostics out of CoreOS. Um, and so, uh, so we want to add in support for KDump so that when, when and if a crash happens, it switches you into a crash kernel, and you can do a lot of analysis right there and find out what's going on. Um, which, of course, also will help us supporting customers. Um, there's going to be ongoing security updates, and just there's something like 250 packages, even with a minimal distribution, that go together to build, to build each distribution. And you know, we'll be curating those and making sure that we're getting them up to the latest and maintaining them. Um, and, and that in and of itself is quite a bit of work. And you know, the last thing is your idea here, right? It's we're, we're opening this up to the community, we're opening up to customers, and we're getting a lot of input. And you know, this is an active project, so we, that we want to see, um, so we want to hear what ideas people have and um, start to get those integrated into the project. So that's with, with that, I'm going to um, hand over to uh, Iago to um, walk you through a demo, and so you can have a little bit of an idea of what the updater service looks like and what the, uh, how it looks like to migrate from CoreOS to Flatcar. Hi. Thank you, Andy. So yeah, I'm going to try to do a live demo. And it's going to be challenging, I think, because I was just preparing this some minutes ago. I'm very jet lagged. And yeah, I was preparing the demo while I was setting up all the monitors out there, so showing the Twitter fit. So let's see. <laughs> um, Okay, so oh, this is huge. Let's make it a bit smaller. Okay, so I have here on the right three instances. Uh, two are Flatcar Linux already, and one is Container Linux by CoreOS. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to update this instance from, from Container Linux by CoreOS to Flatcar Container Linux uh, by connecting it to uh, in, an instance of the Kinfolk update service that uh, uh, Andy was mentioning before. So I have a, an instance set up uh, of this Kinfolk update service, so I'm going to log into that. Although I see that the wireless is down, so I don't think that will work. Let's see if it reconnects. Yeah.
Okay. Let's connect to Chris's phone. If it appears. Can you get closer, Chris? <laughs> Strange. Let's try to connect to the Volvo Park one. Okay, this this seems to be online. Let's see if it doesn't drop. Hmm. Let's try to uh, Gryffindor. <laughs> so many Wi-Fi's. Let's let's try Gryffindor first. Okay. Huh, that doesn't work either. Does is it just that domain? Hmm, that's interesting. Let's this was working some minutes ago, I assure you. I'm getting the same error. All right. That's interesting. Should we try to fix the server on the spot? <laughs> uh, Passphrase, of course. Or we can switch to a video. But let's fix things on the spot first, or try to. This seems to be fine. So the only th problem I can think of is DNS. And if that doesn't work, let's do the video. Let's try Cloudflare. Try HTTPS. Oh, good point. Right, that was it. <laughs> wow. We are secure by default. <laughs> okay, so the first thing that this shows is this OAuth screen. Uh, so we use GitHub for that, and I already, I'm a member of this group, so I'm gonna authorize that. Uh, let's make it smaller. Cool. Yeah, so here you can see the uh, Kinfolk Update Service uh, main screen. That's pretty small. Uh, yeah, so there's an application called Flacker Linux. And of course, you can do more applications if you want. Uh, those applications need to be able to use the Omaha protocol. But uh, yeah, let's go to the Flacker Linux application. Uh, I've created a couple of groups here. So a group is basically a way to group your instances uh, in your cluster. So you can have different policies applied to them. And by policies, I mean things like uh, uh, you know, what, what time should they be updated, only office hours or not, what kind of, what, what channel should it be updated to, uh, how many instances per minute or per hour should be updated, things like that. Um, and so I have this production stable group, which has two instances, which are those on the right. Uh, you see that the UID uh, matches this one. And uh, yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to update it, uh, this one. And I'll first start the update process. I have a script here that does that. And then I'll show the actual script so you can understand what's going on. And yeah, I'll, I'll get going with the update because it has to download it uh, and apply it. So that might take a while. So this script uh, just does these things that uh, Andy was describing in the slide about updating to uh, Flatcar. Uh, first of all, it downloads the public key of Flatcar uh, and mounts it in the right place in the file system. Uh, so yeah, the update is uh, the update is trusted by by the operating system that's running currently in the on the machine, uh, and then it changes the server to this webinar demo instance that I just set up. Uh, so the updates are gotten from that that instance, uh, and then 
to make sure that it really updates, it sets the current release to 0, 0, 0, so it forces an update in a way. Uh, then restarts the update engine and yeah, just tells you to run uh, update engine client update. Yeah, so the update has just downloaded and it's finalizing and yeah, I can go into this instance and you can see that this just got updated. Uh, so 33% of the instances have the update downloaded. So we have three instances here, so math seems to add up. And then we have some diagrams here, so you can see the version breakdown over time uh, in the last like 24 hours or, for, or 48 hours. Uh, and also some diagram about status, so you can see what kind of things happened in the, in the recent past. So yeah, if you click here, you see that there was an update granted and uh, there was a downloading uh, instance for two instances. This was me some minutes ago uh, setting up those instances. And if we go to now, yeah, you see uh, the, all the events that happened. Okay, so let's reboot this instance. So next time we reboot, hopefully this should be running in Flutter Container Linux. Uh, and I don't know if I have time, but I will also like to move one of these instances to the alpha uh, uh, group. So imagine you want an instance that runs more building edge software. So you can just go here uh, to flatcurupdate.conf and change the group to this. And then force an update so we don't have to wait one hour until the instance does it by itself. And in the meantime, I'll SSH to this machine and you see that it's now running flatcurl uh, by Kim Falk on this group, this version, which is a sta the latest stable one. Uh, and now this instance is being moved from stable to alpha. So now you see that's only two instances on the stable group uh, and one instance on alpha, which is downloading. And yeah, this will be the same process. We download the update, it gets applied, you reboot. And after you reboot, you will be running uh, the alpha version. Uh, yeah, while this is downloading, I can show you a couple more diagrams. So you can see your instances one by one with the IP, the instance ID, uh, and you can see a more detailed uh, event timeline so you can know when things happened uh, at what particular time. Uh, so yeah, I think this is a pretty neat way to visualize your cluster. Um, and yeah, while well, I was explaining this, the update finalized. So let's just reboot this and log in to actually show that it updated to the alpha uh, version. Reboot. So this is running on background, so it shouldn't take a long time. Let's wait four seconds more. And SSH. No, maybe now it's done. Yay. So yeah, it's running the version 231701. And so this, so the server knows that this, this instance was updated. I will force an update again. This is just, so the instance pings the update server and it knows that the update is complete. So we can see the nice um, diagram here if Wi-Fi wants to work. Yeah, complete. And yeah, same for stable. Uh, so this instance wasn't, didn't ping the update server yet since it was updated. So let's do that. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so now everything is complete. And yeah, that's pretty much it for the demo. Uh, yeah, I, I hope this shows you a, an overview of what you can do with the Kingfolk update service and how easy it is to update from Container Linux, uh, from CoreOS Container Linux to Flutter Container Linux. Yeah, thank you. If you have any questions, we can, me or Andy, yep. Uh, maybe just give the mic. Uh, so uh, what is this uh, versioning? So, I, uh, so uh, what is the state with versions? Because I saw that uh, Flatcar had the same version as uh, Coros. Yep. Uh, and when you want to introduce some new features as uh, no new features are brought into Container Linux anymore? How do you keep these versions, and when do you want to diverge from it and keep your own versioning? Right. So for now, we've been uh, 
following upstream very, very closely. So every time they do a release, we do a release, and that's, that's that. Uh, we're going to break off that, and we've started with the edge channel. So if you see the edge channel, I maybe can, I can show it again. Uh, yeah, yeah there, there, was, there was a 99 there, which is different. Uh, and the plan is that we will start breaking off uh, in the next weeks with the alpha version. And from that point, the numbers will, won't have anything to do with uh, con Corex Container Linux. Of course, we will use the same schema of uh, days since the first release of the con Corex Container Linux, but they might be totally different. So in, in that sense, we will be uh, yeah, just you know, deciding when we want to release at what day, and the features will be different. <laughs> yeah, is there any support for Nebraska or the update service to run offline or in an air-gapped environment today? Yeah, so uh, Nebraska is an open source project that just runs a server, so this is possible. As long as you update, you upload your uh, update, update payloads in the right places. So yeah, that, that's definitely possible. Um, I'm interested in adopting a GitOps model for all my kind of immutable infrastructure. I'm wondering if Nebraska has plans for kind of submitting pull requests, merge requests to kind of do those updates through kind of a Git-centric, GitOps-based approach. Right. So we have some plans to build a, uh, an API to this, like uh, CoreOS used to have, uh, I think, update, update service CTL or something like that. Uh, so that, I guess, will allow you to do that if you have some pipeline and you just push and then it runs. So yeah, we de definitely have plans for that. It's not there yet, so right now it's just uh, UI-based. 